These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. The year is now 1109 BCE, give or take a bit, and Tiglath Pileser's reign is just getting started after six years of non-stop violence, covered last episode. Now, for those of you who got here without listening to the rest of the show, this is not the biblical Tiglath Pileser. This is Tiglath Pileser the first. This show is a long way from the biblical conqueror, though we do plan to get there eventually. Anyway, the rest of his reign may not be blow by blow like the first few years, but there's still quite a lot we can say about this particular king. In terms of killing, we know that Tiglath Pileser did not only wage war against humans, but against the natural world as well. He thanks the gods Urta and Nurgle in one inscription for a particularly successful hunting trip. In that expedition, he killed four aurochs, a giant wild bull that has since been hunted to extinction, ten Syrian elephants, which have since been hunted to extinction, and 920 lions, which have since been hunted to extinction. The lions may have been a career total, like for his entire army over multiple years, or they could be an inflated number. It doesn't seem likely that one man, even one as bold as Tiglath Pileser, would have, you know, the time to do that much killing all by himself. Whatever the case, all these prestigious animal trophies were brought back to Asher on the backs of four more elephants which had been captured in the hunt and were used to religious ceremonies and to legitimize the king more profoundly with the rest of the city. It's as if everyone is meant to think that here's a man who has power over other humans, who has power over the natural world, which is was a greater concern to the ancient mind than it is to the modern, and he clearly has the favor of the gods. Conceptually, these three were more separate domains in ancient thought than they are today, and his mastery of all three made him lord over the sum total of the known universe at that time. Indeed, it's around this time that Tiglath Pileser revives the old title, King of the Four Corners of the Universe. Now, overly proud titles are rather standard for Near Eastern monarchs, but this one in particular, it's kind of weighty. I mean, it's not super meaningful. Down in the south, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his successors are going to start claiming the title at around the same time, possibly in response to Tiglath Pileser taking it. Uh, but it, it definitely projects a sense that he feels like he's on top of things. And this really does seem to have been the attitude in the early parts of Tiglath Pileser's reign. What we know from scattered later records is that he'll make a few other pretty impressive ventures out of his territory. Mostly, the Aramaeans will attack, Tiglath Pileser will seek vengeance, and manage to kill just enough to claim a victory without really managing to stop the raiders. From what we can tell, these sort of campaigns may have consumed as much as 23 of his 38 years on the throne. Still, his crowning achievement in terms of self-aggrandizement was his great expedition to the Mediterranean coast. For a few years, and we're not sure when exactly, he launched campaigns against the Nairi people in Syria. Now, these guys were pretty tough. It took three campaigns for him to claim a convincing victory here. Now, as far as Tiglath Pileser was concerned, by defeating the Nairi, he had defeated the Hittites. And again, the whole mess of how the Hittites go from an Anatolian empire to a collection of Syrian kingdoms is something we'll look at later. But for now, it's enough to know that the claim of defeating the Hittites was quite a nice thing to be able to claim, even if it doesn't now mean what it would have meant two centuries earlier. Somewhere in these campaigns, either as part of the final defeat of the Nairi or afterwards, just to see who was on the other side of that territory, Tiglath Pileser and his army crossed the Euphrates River and went on a big expedition just to party and plunder. <laughs> 
He stopped by Lebanon for some cedar wood, the favorite souvenir of all conquerors who visit the region, and got a bunch of Canaanite cities to send him tribute. Even the pharaoh sent him a gift, one live crocodile, which is probably a more exciting gift when you have a bunch of servants to deal with the unpleasant parts of crocodile handling. No Israelite cities are mentioned yet. This is either the period of Judges, biblically speaking, or a period before the Israelite tribes had yet coalesced in the skeptical view. And this absence of mention is not a strong indicator either way. But at least lets us know that, indeed, the people of the Bible were not yet players in this region. Anytime we get a look at Canaan and soon enough Israel, we will pause for a mention because I know that some of you are super excited about that. But again, we will do Israel in a whole dedicated thing probably much later. Anyway, Tiglath Pileser visited the city of Arvad on the coast and they took him on a boat tour of the Mediterranean where he managed to kill something he names a Nahiru literally a seahorse, but probably what we would now call a whale. And supposedly they had narwhals in the region back then. And this likely thrilled him immensely. And he went home from his little tribute gathering expedition with yet more wealth and yet more reputation to spend back home in the capital. On his way home, he carved some neat graffiti on some random rocks just out in the countryside, which can still be seen and read today. I mean, read if you can read cuneiform. Pretty much, they're just pictures of Tiglath Pileser besides some text saying how great of a guy he was, but I mean, what else are you going to write on a random rock? But Tiglath Pileser was not a dragon. He did not hoard all of his wealth in a cave, nor did he dive in piles of wealth like Scrooge McDuck. Instead, he put all this wealth to work. Much of it was offered to the gods, which was the most important sort of domestic work an ancient king could do, and the rest was invested into massive building projects. Tiglath Pileser doesn't quite trash talk his dead ancestors, that would be uncouth, but he does mention that quite a lot of neglect had settled over the cities of Asher and Nineveh in particular, and temples, palaces, and defensive structures were constructed, repaired, and enhanced. He even took a lot of the exotic animals which he had collected and made a large zoo. He took many of the plants he had seen, especially on his trip to the Mediterranean coast, and had them planted in a fine garden, which he links rhetorically directly with his bringing prosperity to the nation as a whole, saying directly after the mention of the garden, Unto the land of Assyria I have added land. Unto her peoples I have added people. I have kept good the condition of my people, and in peaceful habitations I have caused them to dwell. Now all these things, temples, walls, palaces, zoo, and garden, would have been impressive and spectacular in his own day. But perhaps most significant is that he funded the construction of a great library, fittingly named the Library of Tiglath Pileser. It isn't clear if we have actual tablets which survive from that library. There's you see a style of clay tablet that's unique to this period of time, made of two layers of distinct clay types. On the outside is a thin layer of ivory white clay, very attractive when pristine, and it's wrapped around an inner core of red clay. Now this would have the effect that when a stylus punches in the cuneiform letters, it would dig down through the white layer and expose the red inner core, leaving red symbols pressed on a white tablet. Now it was for some time argued that these were the distinctive clay tablets of Tiglath Pileser's library, but there are others who suggest that this was simply fashionable for all of Assyria for a good few decades or maybe a century or two. We're not really sure. What has been found in this unique and striking style is not necessarily stuff that would be found in a modern library, 
but the debate is probably just going to sit until more is discovered. More important than whether we nowadays have texts from this library is the fact that for generations and centuries later, future scribes definitely had texts from here. Between references to texts which the scribes tell us were from this library, to texts which claim to be copies from this library, there's no doubt that this was a significant step towards the consolidation of knowledge that was simultaneously taking place down in Babylon. We see this century uh, a sort of bringing together of all that came before. Not a renaissance economically or politically, because they're really about to be hit by a generation or two of intermittent famine and barbarian invasion, but intellectually, they're really engaged in an intellectual process that would probably be considered one of the great artistic movements of history had history bothered to remember it. The earliest library that most people nowadays think of is the Library of Alexandria, founded at the tail end of the Greek era into the Roman period. Now, that library may or may not have actually been unprecedented in scale. I've heard people argue about how big it actually was and when it hit its peak, but Alexander was taking up a tradition that was already thousands of years old by his time, a tradition of great Mesopotamian kings establishing libraries and collecting texts. In fact, we've seen libraries and text repositories before, but Something seems to happen with the intellectual climate following the Bronze Age collapse. Maybe there's a larger volume of texts. Maybe there's just been enough time for ideas to marinate through the scholarly class. But increasingly, we're going to see actual scholarly traditions, people recording extensive amounts of raw data, most notably for us, medical and astronomical data. And with these libraries, we're going to start to see real knowledge synthesis going on. Now, we'll be looking at these in a dedicated episode, which condenses hundreds of years of development into a few headline bits, just because intellectual history is difficult to track over time in this era. But you can draw a straight line from the great library tradition, of which Tiglath Pileser's is going to be a notable exemplar, all the way through to the philosophers, systematizers, and historians of ancient Greece. Of course, we shouldn't overstate things. They could do more with mathematics than I can personally, but they could do far less than real mathematicians can nowadays. And it's important to remember that Tiglath Pileser's library is really only the start of something that won't take full shape until the end of our show. Also, though most listeners will realize this, even though we call it Tiglath Pileser's library, this is just something he ordered, built, and that he funded with his conquests for the sake of his personal glory. It's probably not something he did from a personal love of literature, as far as we're aware. That said, if you have heard of the library of Ashurbanipal a few hundred years down the road, that guy does seem to have been a genuine scholar king, or at least he pretended to be. We'll look at that much more in detail in the far future. Who knows how long that's going to take. Anyway, he brags about his elephants more than his library. That's all I'm saying. And so that more or less rounds out Tiglath Pileser's life, a blow by blow of 38 years of near ceaseless violence, which, if I recounted it for you, would get at some point repetitive. And the overall shape of it is that despite some notable successes, the mounting pressures of hunger and Aramean assault left the empire at his death in an overall weaker state heading for a downward trajectory. But before we get that far, let's head back down to Babylonia, where the climate of intellectual achievement has also been mixing with general famine and barbarian invasion. Nebuchadnezzar had died in about the 15th year of Tiglath Pileser's reign, right at the year 1100 BCE. And though it isn't clear whether they, 
agreed to a formal truce or not, things were generally peaceful between North and South for a time. Nebuchadnezzar's young son, Enlil Nadin Apli, took the throne, and he doesn't seem to have done a very good job of it. We have very few records here, but the domestic records we have mostly focus around Kassite administrators, and do a good job of showing us how much of the Kassite power structure was still relevant even 50 years after the fall of their dynasty. One of these records, mentioned in an earlier episode, is a Kudaru stone, which justifies a land ownership running all the way back to King Gulkashar of the Sealand dynasty, which the stone calculates to have been 696 years previous. Now, our own modern reconstructions of history would say that there may be 30 years or so high with that estimate. Uh, maybe we're talking like 660, 660 years about by a modern reconstruction. But the fact that they had the records to do so well after so many major disasters had fallen on the area reminds us that while we may work with fragments dug out of sand, they had a continuous literary tradition supported by libraries and the Eduba schools. Still, even if Enlil Nadin Apli had a bunch of top scribes running around the region, he himself didn't have a whole lot to recommend himself to anyone. And so, he attacked Assyria. Now, this may have been a wise move, given the climate of the time. He had seen Tiglath-Pileser go off to war every year, many of those against the ever-encroaching barbarians, who may have even managed to a raid against the city of Nineveh at some point in here. And so the idea that Asher was weak, or perhaps that they were exhausted by war, may have seemed reasonable to the king or his advisors, but actually, it turns out that the Babylonians were just wrong, and the expedition was defeated so soundly that the details are not recorded in any of the chronicles. Plus, this attack appears to have violated either a formal or informal ceasefire between Nebuchadnezzar and Tiglath-Pileser. And you see, the way ancient treaties worked, the death of one king usually meant that the treaty could be renegotiated or scrapped without consequence. But given the power imbalance between the two states at this point, it really shouldn't have been the Babylonians upsetting anything. Now, there were no long-term repercussions to either nation with this failed invasion, at least none that we know about. But as soon as the young king of Babylon returned back to his palace in defeat, his uncle, Marduk Nadin Ahi, who was the brother of Nebuchadnezzar, got a group of nobles together killed him, and took the throne. Now, there's a black joke here, as Enlil Nadin Apli's name was a prayer by Nebuchadnezzar giving thanks to Enlil for giving him an heir. And sure enough, Enlil granted that the boy would be heir, but only for four brief, unsuccessful years. Meanwhile, Marduk Nadin Ahi means Marduk is the giver of brothers, usually indicating a much younger son, Though in this case, the blessing of brothers did not turn out well for Nebuchadnezzar's own progeny. Now, with Nebuchadnezzar's brother on the throne, things are going to start turning around. Not 100% for the better, but that's not really his fault. Famine and barbarian invasion are the name of the game now that we're past 1100 BCE. And Babylon, with a weaker army than Assyria has is about to catch that square on the jaw. But before the looming disasters really take hold, Marduk Nadin Ahi needs to get his army together so that they can court a more immediate sort of disaster. Having just taken the throne from a king who was unable to win a war against Assyria, the best way for him to prove himself was with a war against Assyria. And it so happens that this was likely little more than a raid, and likely conducted while Tiglath-Pileser was out on another front. He took his army into the city of Ekelata and captured the city's two gods, Adad and Shala. 
He probably grabbed some wealth and slaves on his way home, but it's the gods alone which were remembered by later history. Now, it's perhaps a testament to how hard-pressed Tiglath-Pileser was in the back end of his reign that he wasn't able to get his troops together to respond right away. And relations seem to have been frigid, but peaceful for a few more years, until Marduk Nanahe pushed his luck yet again with another raid into Assyrian territory, though this one was not very deep. In the meantime, things are generally quiet in Babylon. They were building projects in the capital and in Ur, and probably in a few other places, though it wasn't a great burst of construction activity. We do get mentions in later texts that there were important astrological signs being recorded in this era, along with the sorts of weather which accompanied the various star signs, though we don't actually have the documents themselves from this far back, just mentions in later documents that earlier scholars in Marduk Nanahe's reign had worked on this sort of stuff. The record is quiet enough that we assume that things were going along just fine, though that same silence could well have hide the fact that the creeping decline was already starting to set in. Then the hammer fell. We aren't certain the year, but perhaps somewhere around 1090 BCE, or maybe a bit later, Tiglath-Pileser assembled all the chariotry in the Lower Zab, which we seem to be meant to assume is quite a large number, but it's an interesting turn of phrase. Why was he gathering the chariots at this specific border region? Is it because the chariots from other regions were occupied with another war, or that they were exhausted from previous wars? Or was the need to attack Babylon discovered so quickly that more distant soldiers could not be mobilized? Or was he trying to bring more prestige and attention to the Lower Zab region, for the Chronicles, for some now-forgotten political reason. The more details we get about ancient history, the more often we come across these curious points of phrasing, for which any clarification is long, likely long since blown away with the desert sands. Anyway, that army, whatever its size or composition, drew up against the city of Arzahina, a fortified border town between the two nations. The Assyrian Chronicles don't mention the outcome and don't mention any further progress, which pretty certainly means that he was defeated here and he broke up his army to go pillage the border region with little real impact. But then in the next year he drew up his army again and bypassed Arzahina completely with seemingly little opposition and he pushed into the Babylonian heartland. He took the old Kassite palace city of Durkurigalzu, the major city of Sippar, the region around the old city of Akkad, which apparently has not been lost yet, and the city of Babylon itself. This is the first time in maybe 60 or 70 years that Babylon has been pillaged, and Tiglath-Pileser is rightly quite pleased with himself. However, this victory was almost certainly very short-lived, as there were a number of important artifacts which he should have plundered from Babylon, like those two gods, Adad and Shala, which had been taken perhaps a decade earlier, and which he probably would have taken if he had time. But either the threat from the Arameans was so great that he truly couldn't spend, spend the time to pause in the south, or the Babylonian army had not actually been defeated, but merely avoided through clever strategic maneuvering. Whatever the case, the victory in this period went soundly to the Assyrians, even if they weren't really able to capitalize it. And Babylon will find itself unable to score any major military victories for generations to come while Babylonian science and economic prosperity has not yet been wholly annihilated, the decline has set in hard. And we're going to hear less and less about Assyria's southern neighbor for the next few centuries. We don't know what the situation in Babylon looked like after the sack, but however bad it was, 
it was about to get worse. By the end of Marduk Nadan Ahe's reign, the famine had set in, both within Mesopotamia and in the outlying regions. In the civilized areas, this manifested as a whole bunch of human misery and death. In the fringe regions, it turned the already invading Arameans into a desperate army. The people in the hardest-hit communities around Babylon supposedly resorted to eating human flesh, and the Aramean invasion appears to have focused primarily on seizing as much of the settled area's crops as possible in search of their own sustenance. The Babylonian people died in large numbers to hunger and Aramean spears, and in one of the most interesting passages from the ancient chronicles, we're told that the Babylonian king Marduk Nadan Ahe simply vanished in the midst of the chaos, with no real sense of how or why he died. This disappearance was perhaps in the year 1801, and he was succeeded by his son, Marduk Shapikzeri. And right as Marduk Shapikzeri takes over, a funny thing happens. We have very few details, but the famine seems to just end, and then abates for the next 13 years, over the entire course of this king's reign. Now, is that true? Or is that just what the Chronicles want us to think for whatever reason? We're getting into an historical period where we're increasingly aware of the political biases in our written sources, especially because we have sources from multiple civilized nations at times, and we have much better evidence from archaeology to sometimes indicate when things are being maybe exaggerated or neglected for political effect. But at the same time, it does seem to have been a much more peaceful decade or so, than what came before or after. For this guy to show up in between all this mess of what happened before and in light of what's about to hit Babylon like a truck, it's like Marduk Shapik Zeri, whose name, by the way, means Marduk is the outpourer of seed, is the eye of a great historical storm. He built a few buildings, he concluded a larger treaty with the Assyrians, and in some historical records of economic prices, the cost of most goods was right at their historical average, which just the fact that we're starting to get records of economic prices in this time period is already pretty impressive. But this indicates that there were, probably, no major shortages or crises. He rules for 13 years, which are so quiet that it makes more sense to shift our focus back up north for the rest of the episode, and likely for many episodes to come, so just get used to it. And with that, we finally get to the death of Tiglath-Pileser up in Asher. He ruled for 38 very busy years, dying around 1176 BCE. His son, Asharid Apel Akur, took the throne right afterwards. His reign is notable for being the first to elevate and record a court official called an Umanu, roughly a chief royal scribe, which would become a more prominent feature as Assyria went forward, showing an increased level of bureaucracy within the king's palace and in the administration of government. In fact, it's quite likely that the Assyrians are here copying the Babylonians. Uh, we did mention last episode, I don't remember, in a previous episode, we mentioned that Nebuchadnezzar had a famous chief scribe uh, who wrote the Babylonian theodicy. And next episode, we're going to look a lot at the chief Babylonian scribe of Nebuchadnezzar's successor, who is... Uh, Esagil Ken Apli, and these two guys, who may have been one guy, I mentioned it before, we're going to treat him like two guys, these two guys are so intellectually impressive that it's likely the Assyrians started to get jealous. And so, after two years of Asherid Apel Eker being on the throne, with nothing of note having been actually accomplished, aside from 
elevating this chief scribe, he died. It seems likely that there was a good deal of turmoil, though whether that involved famine and invasion, or internal political discord, or the empire having grown larger than it could probably manage, or of course a mix of all of these, is deeply unclear. He's replaced by his brother Asher Belkala, meaning Asher is the lord of all, who would prove to be a sight more successful. In fact, beyond just being successful, if we follow the inscriptions uncritically, he would be, appear to be an exact duplicate of his father, Tiglath Pileser. He often uses identical wording when describing his military exploits. He appears to do exactly the same things his father did, attacking northern tribes, hunting, even building zoos and gardens described with much the same words as his father. Of course, it's quite possible that if many of the words are the same, it's because he's still doing much the same work as Tiglath Pileser had done. He's still mostly fighting Arameans with little long-term success. He's still fighting the northern mountain people because stuff keeps moving in. And he still needs to carve out the mountains to get to them because the mountains are still really hard to pass through. He makes an expedition to the Levant because uh, there's still badly needed wealth to plunder over there. And he still gets gifts from the Egyptian court, but he does his father one better, getting a crocodile and a gorilla. But that's just because major, major kings give each other gifts when they pass by. That's just normal. And so perhaps a bit of fatherly resemblance is as much circumstance as it is a deliberate propaganda effort to capitalize on the best parts of his father's successes and to help distract people from the whole massive famine and barbarian invasion thing that was going on at the same time. Perhaps more significant than the similarities is some of the key differences. Whereas his father talked about the Ahlamu Arameans, and in the earliest records seemed a bit fuzzy as to who exactly these people are. By the time Asher Belkala is having his histories recorded, huge swaths of the northwest border area are now called the land of the Arameans. This indicates that these folks have gone from being one pest among many to the absolutely dominant force in the region, though whether they control the area in a unified political sense or not is hard to tell at this point. By this point, the Arameans seem to have mastered many different kinds of warfare. They continued the nomadic raiding that made them rich at the expense of their neighbors and definitely had the numbers and tactics needed to overwhelm whole cities. But they also mastered the ability to choose where they fight and did a great job of restricting the armies of Ashurbel Kala to rough terrain where the Assyrian army was now largely unable to even bring them to single open battles. And when battles were fought, the victories were far more limited. To make things worse, when we do have locations clearly named which we can identify, they indicate that the Assyrians were fighting the Arameans far deeper in Assyrian territory than was common in Tiglath Pileser's wars, telling us that Ashurbel Kala, despite his best efforts, is not managing to hold back the tide of invasion. It wasn't just the Arameans he had to deal with, though. We know the city of Mari, which we haven't heard from in a long time, has at some point broken loose of Asher's domination, though we have no clear idea when, and their king, Tukulti Mur, is apparently now enough of a, na of a regional power to attempt an invasion of Assyrian lands, not once, but twice. At least one of these ill-considered invasions ended with Asher Belkala marching into Mari, plundering the city, and pulling some of its people away as slaves. But enough is missing here that we don't really know if Mari remained an independent power or was properly subjugated at this point. This was a victory in a certain sense, but really, the fact that the city of Mari had to be discouraged from invading Assyrian territory at all is a sign of things going badly. But at least on the southern front, 
things went well for Ashurbelkala. Marduk Shapakzeri was on the throne when Ashurbelkala became king, and the two formally confirmed a, pre a peace between the two nations, which held for the whole of Marduk Shapakzeri's seemingly bucolic reign. Then, maybe around 1065 BCE, the happy reign of Babylon's king ended with the king's death. At this point, we have no clear idea of why things are happening, but there must have been some sort of major disruption upon Marduk Shapakzeri's death. Perhaps the disruption caused the king's death, or perhaps the various factions of the Isan dynasty couldn't agree on his successor, or perhaps everything was going fine and the Assyrians invaded for no real reason. We do have to leave that possibility open. Whatever the case, Ashurbelkala gathered the chariots before his Babylonian friend's corpse had yet cooled and marched down the Tigris. In Ashurbelkala's own records, he focuses on the fact that he entered dur Kurigalzu, the old Kassite period capital just upriver from Babylon, and captured a gov governor by the name of Kadashman Buryash. Now this is interesting for a few reasons. This guy has a Kassite name, but he's called the son of Itimarduk Balatu, which is an Akkadian name. As a governor, he was likely a descendant from the old Kassite power structure, and it's quite possible that his father was a Kassite who had adopted an Akkadian name. Given that we are maybe like 70 years now from the fall of the Kassite dynasty, it isn't unthinkable that at least some Kassites were adopting Akkadian names. We even saw that with at least one Kassite king, so why wouldn't a governor do it as well? The alternative, an Akkadian native becoming Kassite, is much harder to imagine given how closed off the Kassites seem to have been from their fellow Babylonians in many ways. Another possibility is that this is the very Itimarduk Balatu who had previously been king in Babylon, and this was some sort of Kassite great-grandson through an obscure branch of intermarriage. It isn't impossible, though it also isn't unthinkable to think that there were simply two Idi Marduk Balatus in this period. It's apparently a pretty common name. Anyway, the fact that a Kassite governor in the old Kassite capital city, likely part of the Kassite power structure, is the personal target of a war from Assyria at the death of the king, very strongly suggests that he was making some sort of play to overthrow the Isan dynasty entirely. Maybe he was involved in the king's death, which would be the sort of thing that would definitely trigger most treaties of international friendship that we know about. Or maybe he was attempting to clear out the succession. Whatever the case, he was soundly defeated. In the wake of this incident, however, it appears that there may not have been any surviving heir in the direct line for the throne. The fellow who takes power in Babylon next does so very explicitly at the hands of Asher Belkala. Adad Apla Idna, whose name means Adad has given me an heir, is a figure of deeply unclear parentage. In one inscription, he's called the son of Idi Marduk Balatu, suggesting that he was somehow in the line of the Isan dynasty. In another inscription, he's called the son of a nobody. In yet a third inscription, he's called an Aramean usurper. Older scholarship seems to have been a bit baffled by the question of who this guy could be, but it's pretty clear now that at least he wasn't an Aramean. What his exact lineage is, is unclear. He could well have been from some odd branch of the Isan dynasty, or he could literally have been a nobody, though the former is more likely. Wherever he came from, he was an Assyrian puppet. His wife was an Assyrian princess. He sent a huge bride price to Assyria, and the Assyrian Chronicle records that the people of Babylon and Asher lived in peace and pretty much open, peaceful borders for a period of time. This was something more than an alliance with Babylon as the junior partner, though not quite a vassal relationship. 
the two nations lived at peace with a very clear sense of who was more powerful, and the entire Mesopotamian civilization together reached its glorious golden peak probably in this generation. But Adad Apla Idna was an Assyrian puppet, and also got absolutely smashed by some of the strongest and most successful Aramean invasions to date, the two of which combined to overshadow his tremendous accomplishments in peacemaking, construction, and in the patronage of learning, leaving him absolutely vilified and despised by later generations to the extent that one of the most striking and popular epics of the late period, the epic of the plague god Era, was set around his kingship. At least, we think it might have been. We'll get to that in the future. All of this because he was an Assyrian puppet and lost some wars. Now, we'll be turning back to those wars that he lost, because honestly, things get pretty bad. But before we do that, the literary scientific golden age that I keep mentioning really reaches its peak here. There is a ton to talk about. There's more building activity recorded under Adad Apla Idna than any other Babylonian king until the tail end of the Neo-Assyrian period, some three or four hundred years from now. But most interestingly, at least to me, the art of omens and massive data recording finally matures in the person of Esagil Kin Apli, perhaps the most famous scientist who you've never heard of. So join us next time for a bit of construction, a bit of destruction, and a whole lot about a man who was basically Einstein 3,000 years before Einstein. Thank you for listening.